Okay, so I did already my little introduction. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm a Wisconsinite. I'm an audiologist by training. The only thing that I didn't say is that I did my training at Washington University in St. Louis. But of course, I returned back to my home state in Wisconsin to finish up my training. So uh, you might be wondering if you're in the right talk. You are certainly in the right talk, yes. Um, if you think you have hearing loss, if you've been told by your spouse or your child that you might have hearing loss, or if you know or care about someone with hearing loss, then this talk is for you. Today we'll be talking specifically about age-related hearing loss, which if you take away nothing else from this talk, I want you to know that it's extremely common. And you might already suspect um, that hearing loss can affect both the person with the loss and the people that are around them. <clears throat> so let's start with a pop quiz. You can either unmute or put it in the chat. Which of these individuals has hearing loss? I think I can see the chat. Let me just turn. Okay, we've got all, all, all of them so far. Perhaps all. You guys are too smart. <laughs> so I was going to say, this is kind of a, a trick question. Um, the answer is that all of them can have hearing loss. Um, you might associate hearing loss with the gentleman on the right, but the truth is that hearing loss affects people of all ages. Just before I go on, is the volume a little bit better? Yes, and I'm back to seeing your, um, like I don't see your big presentation anymore. Don't see the big presentation? Yep. Okay. I've got multiple screens, so I'm just making sure that I've got all the... Okay, are you seeing big slides or little yep. slides? Yep, perfect. Sure. Okay, awesome. Okay, so you can have hearing loss from birth or you can be born with hearing loss. There are babies that are born with hearing loss due to infection like uh, cytomegalovirus or Zika virus. They can have genetic syndromes that cause hearing loss. Uh, there can be hearing loss caused by very low birth weight or lack of oxygen during birth or trauma during birth. Uh, most babies that are born with hearing loss though do have a very specific mutation in their genes that causes hearing loss but no other complications. You can also lose your hearing loss at any point in your life. Uh, not to scare you, just kind of going over the basics, but um, you can acquire hearing loss um, from an infection or virus, just like with babies. Um, but you can also have a medication that might be ototoxic or toxic to the ears, um, or you can have uh, trauma. So let's say you get hit in the head, you might lose your hearing from that. And if you've ever had IV antibiotics or loop diuretics or chemotherapy, um, those are all sometimes uh, related to hearing loss, so you might you might be asked by that if a doctor, if you say that I've got a complaint of hearing loss or an audiologist, they might tell you um, it might be related to that. You can also lose part of your hearing, all of your hearing, from exposure to a loud noise or lots of loud noises. So if you're a veteran or a farmer or if you've worked in a noisy factory, you might be familiar with a kind of hearing loss that is attributed to noise exposure. So where part of your hearing is damaged from being exposed to either a one really loud sound or a bunch of loud sounds over time from things like equipment. Um, even dentists actually have an increased risk of hearing loss from the high frequency sound from the drills that they use. So what is age-related hearing loss or presbycusis? Age-related hearing loss is hearing loss that's acquired over time as you age, as the, the name implies, and it affects specifically the hearing nerve. So you might call that or hear that called sensory neural or nerve-related hearing loss, which means that it comes from the hearing nerve and not from anything that's blocking the ear, like wax. The wax can sometimes uh, contribute a little bit to that hearing loss if you've got too much of it. Age-related hearing loss affects high-pitched sounds more than low-pitched sounds. So think bird tweets versus cow moos. And unfortunately, those high-pitched sounds make up most of our consonants. So our T's, our D's, our S's, 
And those consonants are really important for understanding speech. Age-related hearing loss is symmetrical, meaning that it affects both ears in the same way. So one ear is probably not gonna go down before the other ear does. And it's very common. I'm gonna kind of hit this a lot of times, but age-related hearing loss is very common. It affects one in three adults over the age of 65, and that increases to one in two adults uh, over the age of 70. So loss of high-pitched sounds, it might be the first thing that you see. And I'm going to go over, um, this is called the audiogram, and it's a graph of how you hear. Um, so in numbers, uh, your audiologist might say you have uh, this type of hearing loss of mild, moderate, um, but that's also attributed to a graph. So the graph on the right is what we call an audiogram, and it represents the thresholds or the very the most quiet sound that you can hear. So sounds on the very top of the graph are very, very quiet and get louder as you go lower on the graph. And from left to right, the sounds go from very low pitch, remember that, that cow sound, to very high pitch or the bird. And this represents the general range of sounds that humans can hear. So the higher on the graph you are, the better or more sensitive your hearing is. And normal adults, or adults with normal hearing, I should say, um, have hearing thresholds at where that red line is, right at about 20 decibels or, or dBs. Uh, so the higher in the graph you are, the more sensitive your hearing is. And anything that falls below that uh, kind of normal line of 20 uh, would be considered hearing loss. And like we talked about kind of on previous slides, age-related hearing loss affects those higher pitch sounds. You can see in the graph that normal hearing uh, on sorry, that hearing is in the normal range here on the left side of the graph. You can see that black line that is up by the 20 line, and then it slopes down to outside of that normal range on the right. That's what we would call um, sensory neural high frequency hearing loss, which is pretty much what age-related hearing loss is or presbycusis. So those lower sounds, those vowels are, are still going to be in the normal range of hearing, but what's harder to hear is those high-pitched sounds, those consonant sounds. You might also hear that um, quiet sounds are too quiet. That might be a complaint of somebody with hearing loss. And that happens because, uh, so we have this huge range here. We can see from the, the very small numbers to the high numbers in this graph. And when you have hearing loss, it squishes that range of hearing and so quiet sounds are still really quiet and then loud sounds get loud really quickly. You've got just a really small range to work in. So uh, something that you might notice if you feel like you have hearing loss is that quiet sounds are too quiet and loud sounds are all of a sudden too loud. Another sign of age-related hearing loss is tinnitus or ringing in the ears. Ringing in one or both of your ears is, is fairly common. I have ringing in my ears every now and then. Um, and I don't worry too much about it because it doesn't last for very long. Tinnitus is uh, defined as persistent ringing. So I would say ringing lasting more than 10 minutes, persistent ringing in the ears. And that can be associated with age-related hearing loss from a loss of those high frequencies. Lastly, uh, a sign of age-related hearing loss might be no sign. Uh, or at least no sign that the person with hearing loss notices. So age-related hearing loss happens, as we've said before, gradually or slowly over time, so slowly that you yourself might not notice it. What happens is that uh, friends or family often notice it first. They might say you're missing details of the conversation or you're mishearing them or that you're not paying attention to them. It's also very common to mistake hearing loss for the beginnings of dementia, for all the things that I mentioned before, not hearing or not understanding or feeling like you're not paying attention. And sometimes um, they can overlap a little bit. So uh, oftentimes we'll see people come in for a referral suspecting of dementia and it turns out to be hearing loss. So there are some things that we know put you at a greater risk for age-related hearing loss. Moving from the left to the right, age, of course, uh, being male, history of exposure to loud noise like we talked about, and a family history of hearing loss can all put you at a greater risk. We also mentioned before a few occupations 
uh, farmers, factory workers, veterans. More things that increase your risk are diabetes, hypertension, use of ototoxic or toxic to the ears drugs, and smoking. You'll notice that some of these risk factors are things that are in your control, like smoking, and some of them are very much not in your control. What we know from studies of hearing loss is that there are links between health behaviors and untreated hearing loss. So people with untreated hearing loss might be more likely to withdraw from social situations and might have a reduced awareness to surroundings, which affects safety. Hearing loss has also been linked to impaired memory and the ability to learn new tasks. Other studies have found that untreated hearing loss um, it puts you at an increased risk for fatigue, tension, stress, depression. Uh, this is actually true for everybody with hearing loss. Listening is, is really hard work and can be really taxing on the brain, especially if, if there's noise or if people aren't talking uh, very clearly. There's also an increased risk of social rejection and loneliness, as well as reduced job performance and earning power. You can probably see how some of these health behaviors might be linked to each other and could be related to a reduced ability to hear. One important thing that I wanna note though, is that just because that we find these things are related, it does not mean that they're necessarily going to happen to everybody with hearing loss. We're just seeing maybe some associations. The very good news is that researchers are really interested in studying how hearing loss affects people over their lifespan, especially in older age, and they're very interested in finding solutions. I'm going to check in and make sure I'm loud enough. <coughs> I'm going to assume yes, unless somebody says I'm too quiet. <coughs> Excuse me. So the last area that I want to touch on um, research-wise is dementia. This has been a very, very hot topic of research in recent years, and you might have seen this finding in newspapers or in magazines. The Lancet is specifically the article I'm talking about. Uh, it's a medical journal that is committed to disseminating uh, medical research out to everybody, and they published a report in both 2017 and 2020 on health and lifestyle factors that are related to dementia with the goal of increasing public awareness. Much like hearing loss, researchers have identified things that you can and cannot control that increase your risk of dementia, and they call those things risk factors. And the risk factors that you can control are called modifiable risk factors, meaning that they can be changed. So several studies have found that mild hearing loss, even mild hearing loss, can increase the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. Because of this, hearing loss has been identified as a modifiable or changeable risk factor for dementia because it can be treated or helped by the use of hearing aids or cochlear implants. Though it's unclear exactly how it affects cognitive decline, the thinking is that uh, the things I mentioned before, like depression, social isolation, can all be kind of intermixed with, um, with the causes of dementia. Again, this is still very, very early research. It's just something that you might've been kind of hearing in the news. So I wanted to explain a little bit where that's coming from. When they say that hearing loss is one of eight modifiable risk factors for dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Hearing loss is often referred to as um, a hidden disability or an invisible disability because you can't tell if somebody has a hearing loss by looking at them. So if you saw this man on crutches, uh, walking towards the door, you might offer to hold the door open for him because you recognize that he might need an accommodation or an aid because of his injury. That's not true for hearing loss. You can't really see that. There's no physical signs which can make asking for accommodations or for aid difficult and, and awkward. It can also make conversations with new people challenging if they don't know you have a hearing loss or if you're talking to them in a loud or noisy environment. Because hearing loss is not visible, it's important to be your own advocate. Advocating for yourself might look like asking a doctor to have your hearing loss documented in your medical chart. This can be important because um, in medical emergencies, you might need to have some information communicated towards you or they, or they might be talking to you and you're not responding and they don't know why that is. Or it might be a symptom or related to another disease that's important for your doctor to know about. 
it's essential for you to be able to understand medical information that your doctor is telling you as well. One very common thing that I see or that I used to do in clinic and that I see done is um, typing on a computer. So not just having the doctor tell you the information out loud, but if you're not understanding what they're saying, they can type it on a document, make it really big so that you know exactly what they're talking about. Advocating for yourself might also look like telling your family and your friends what you need to hear better. Some of the ways to improve communication can be to tell your family and friends, slow down or face me when you're talking to me, or can you not talk to me when I am facing the other way? These can be hard to do. And so I wanted to practice, try writing down a few of them. And so can we take just a few minutes? Um, so my question that I posed to you to brainstorm for just a little bit is what could you say to a, a new doctor that maybe doesn't know you have hearing loss? And what could you say to your granddaughter who maybe has a high-pitched voice um, and you can't hear very well? So let's just take like three minutes. You can either write it in the chat or unmute um, when, you, when you think of something. Laura had a good one. Let them know that you have hearing aids and also let them know that you use hearing aids. Tell your doctor that. You can tell your doctor specific experiences that you've encountered. That's a good one, Just saying some tangible things. Ask them to talk slower. That's a great one. I tend to be, I tend to be a fast talker, which you might have noticed. Um, and so, uh, sorry, somebody asked what, I, what my ask was of you. I was just asking for what might be some examples of things that you could say to your doctor or your granddaughter to help communication. Grand, oh, that's a great one, Patty. Stand in front of you and speaking, use a normal tone of voice, high-pitched. Yeah, that's a good point. So kids' kids voices are in that high-pitched, high-frequency area, and so it can be really, really challenging to hear them, especially if they're excited and talking and oh, getting all worked up. Remind the doctor that you've had a hearing assessment. Very great. Or ask for a hearing assessment. I like that one. Lori, that's great. Ask for them to talk into your better ear if you have a better ear. These are awesome. There are a lot coming in. You guys are killing it. Slow down. Slow down is a great one. And I will attest, especially when I get excited, I start talking about something I'm passionate about, like, like hearing loss. Um, I can talk fast. Luckily, I talk loud, but I can talk fast. Explain that grandma doesn't hear as well and ask her to repeat or slow down. Those are all super great. Thank you for sharing those. One thing that I wrote down because I thought that I should do this exercise as well if I was going to ask you is that um, when I'm washing the dishes, Sometimes I'll have headphones in, but oftentimes I'll be washing the dishes, making a lot of noise, the water is running, and my husband will maybe be in the kitchen as well and start telling me a story. And one thing I can ask of him is, can you please get my attention before you start talking to me when I'm washing the dishes? That way I know what's going on and I don't catch your story maybe, maybe midway. Okay, thanks for sharing guys. Those are all really great ones. Okay, so we're gonna move on a little bit to some of the treatment options. Um, and depending on the degree of hearing loss you have or where you are in your journey or what you're ready to think about, there are a range of technologies that can help you hear better. And there are also some low or no tech things that we'll talk about that can help you hear better as well. So today we'll talk a little bit I think my slides are off from what I'm doing. Are you still seeing my big slides? I think we do. Yep. Okay, great. So today we'll talk a little bit about hearing aids and about how low or no technology options um, are available as well. We'll save cochlear implants, even though they're my personal favorite and my area of expertise. We'll save those for another day. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to have you email me offline about that. Uh, 
Briefly, cochlear implants are an implantable hearing technology for um, individuals with very severe hearing loss. So we'll talk a little bit more on the, on the mild side today, things that fit in with age-related hearing loss. So when you think of hearing aids, especially the hearing aids maybe your grandparents or your parents used, you might think of something like this. Uh, mostly a joke, although these uh, were used, these are actual pictures. Um, but it's it's normal to think of hearing aids as a, a larger kind of clunky technology that you'd wear on your ear. And it's also normal to feel self-conscious about wearing a hearing aid at first. The good news is modern hearing aids are very, very small and can be nearly invisible on your ear. So there's two main ways that you can purchase a hearing aid, either through an audiologist like myself or over the counter, which is a newer option. Over-the-counter hearing aids have only very, very recently been made an option. They were recently approved by the FDA to treat mild to moderate hearing loss. You might have seen these advertised to you in publications that you read. Um, you might have gotten flyers in the mail about this. It's a very, uh, very hot topic because they were just approved this fall. So as you can see here on the right, these hearing aids can be really discreet and come in a variety of styles. Some go all the way in the ear that you can't see at all. Some are really small and go behind the ear. Some are behind the ear and have a tube that fit into an ear mold. They've got tons and tons of different styles. I don't know if you can even tell the man in the top picture is wearing a hearing aid. I can because I'm an audiologist and I know to look for that little string that you pull it out for, uh, but they can be very discreet. And modern hearing aids also can connect to your phone or play music, or play or stream your, your phone calls right to your hearing aids. Some can be recharged and not have to use those tiny little batteries that are impossible to use. And they can even change automatically depending on the environment that you're in. So if you go from a really quiet place to a really noisy place, they make hearing aids that adjust automatically to account for that difference. So whether you have an audiologist fit your hearing aid, or if you buy one on your own over the counter, it's important to first have a hearing test. So to have a hearing test, you need to see a licensed audiologist. And the good news is that most insurance plans, including Medicare and Medicaid, cover the hearing test. Not really the hearing aid so much, unfortunately, but the hearing test is covered. So the information is covered. You do need a referral from a primary care provider if you are a Medicare recipient but it doesn't have to be a written approval. You can call your office and ask for a referral. Having a hearing test is important for two reasons. First, to rule out a cause of hearing loss that might need further attention. So if your hearing loss is not age-related hearing loss or is tied to some other maybe condition or is caused by a blockage in your ear, um, you need to know that before you start wearing a hearing aid. And second, it's really important because you need to know what kind of hearing loss you have and what hearing aid might be most appropriate for your kind of hearing loss. So if you see an audiologist to get your hearing aid, they'll pick out the most appropriate hearing aid for you and make a suggestion. And I, as I said before in the last slide, the over-the-counter hearing aids are only for mild to moderate hearing loss. And so if that's what you think you have, it's great to go to the audiologist and get confirmed that that's the kind of hearing loss you have. Otherwise, you're only going to get a limited benefit from those over-the-counter hearing aids if your hearing loss is greater than that. As I mentioned before, the FDA only very recently approved the sale of over-the-counter hearing aids for those with mild to moderate hearing loss, just October 2022. So very, very recently. We've been pushing for this and talking about this for many years. Um, that finally happened in October. And so here are some of the differences between the two. Um, a prescription hearing aid is fit by an audiologist versus over-the-counter is fit by you. Typically, prescription hearing aids are anywhere from $1,000 to $7,000, and over-the-counter hearing aids are about $1,000. Over-the-counter hearing aids are only for those that are 18 and older, so they're not appropriate for kids, and they are typically a, a one-size-fits-most. So you might get a, a custom ear mold from an audiologist. They take an impression of your ear. Um, with over-the-counter, you're a little bit more on your own. Um, sometimes they'll have kind of a foam tip or something that you can form to your ear. Another big difference between over-the-counter hearing aids and prescription hearing aids, uh, there is a mandated 30-day return policy for the prescription hearing aids. So because they're expensive and because they're a prescribed technology, 
there are laws in place that let you return those and get your money back if you're not happy. There isn't a return policy for the ones that are over the counter. Um, the FDA did not mandate that, so it's just a little bit riskier financially. Um, and then again, I, I kind of harked on this a little bit, but this is one important thing that I want you to know. Over-the-counter hearing aids are for mild to moderate hearing loss only, and then prescription hearing aids are, are for all kinds of hearing loss. So moving on from hearing aids, let's talk about some low or no technology solutions. Um, if you're not ready for a hearing aid, the good news is that there are things that you can do for free to help you hear and communicate better. One of the things that you can do is be in the right place. So it might be tempting to have a conversation with somebody in the next room. Let's say, you know, my, my kitchen and my living room kind of flow together. And oftentimes my husband and I will have shouted conversations across the distance, but that's really not good practice. Uh, things like walls and furniture absorb and block sound. So you really wanna be in the same room with somebody before you start a conversation. As some of you pointed out, and when we were brainstorming for advocating, ask the speaker to face you. Um, so, you know, if it's my husband's turn to, to wash the dishes and he's telling me a story and his back is to me because he's washing the dishes, I'm probably not gonna catch what he's saying. Um, you need to see someone's mouth to get those additional clues. You might have noticed that mask wearing has made it a little bit harder, and not just because the masks block a little sound. We actually, we watch people's mouths. Even if you think you're not doing it, we do pick up those little cues from, from the shape of somebody's mouth, and so it's important to be able to see someone's face when you're talking to them. This might seem um, a little counterintuitive, this last one, but let's say you're in a noisy restaurant, and you want to sit with um, you want to sit in a way that helps you hear the best, to so block out the noise and listen to the person that you're talking to. You might be inclined to um, sit maybe in a private corner, and, and that's good, but the, the best thing that you can do is sit facing the person, obviously, that you're talking to with all of that noise behind you. And the reason that's so helpful is because your ears, like this adorable basset hound, your ears are like little cups or little shells designed to catch sound. And so they're, they face forward so that you can catch sounds that are coming into your ears and sounds that are coming to the back of your ears are blocked. It's just kind of our natural acoustics that happen that are that we're born with. So you want to sit with your noise with the noise to your back so that your ears block out that noise and you can catch all the little sound that's coming to you from the speaker. Try next time you're in a noisy restaurant, maybe switch back and forth and see which one's easier for you. I will say I've tried it a few times and it definitely, it definitely is helpful. So some more low tech solutions include using headphones or speakerphone to talk on the phone to take advantage of both ears. So your ears are really similar to eyes and that they work best in a pair. So using headphones on both ears or speakerphone lets you use both ears and your brain can take the signal from both ears and compare and say, I think what they said was this. And it's much easier than just having one ear in. If you have trouble hearing music or your TV program, you might consider getting a portable speaker that could be put closer to you. This can be more comfortable for those that are you know, watching TV with you in the same room who might not, near, not, might not need that sound to be as loud. So having a speaker that can connect to the TV that you can put positionally closer to you will help you kind of avoid that, uh, that disagreement from two people watching TV. If you use a hearing aid, there are accessories like a remote microphone that uh, maybe your speaker, the person that you're talking to can wear, or a TV streamer that t streams the sound directly from the TVs into your hearing aid to connect the sound source right to your ears. So there are a few options that you can add on if you do already use hearing aids to make it a little bit better and a few kind of low-tech options that you can try to see if they help improve your communication. So circling back to our advocacy practice, there are some things that we can say and do when we're communicating with our friends and family that make communicating easier. So as someone with hearing loss, as the person with hearing loss, rather than asking what, what repeatedly, ask someone to repeat or rephrase what they said. I think somebody pointed that out in the, um, in the suggestions for advocacy, repeat, or, or say, oh, I'm not kidding, can you rephrase what you said? That's a good way to um, avoid frustration. If you're not sure what they said, you could try asking, 
did you say, and then say what you thought they said and make a guess at what they said. This is often quicker and less frustrating than asking what, what repeatedly until, until one of you gets frustrated and gives up. For communication partners, so if you are not the person with hearing loss, but you talk to somebody with hearing loss, whether that's your spouse or your friend, um, there are some things you can do as well. So one we talked about, get their attention before speaking. Speak slowly and clearly, especially when wearing a face mask. We just talked about this a little bit. Those masks, even, even the thinner surgical ones, can still block or damper sound, and you don't have those cues from your mouth. So you need to speak slower, more loudly, and in a very articulated manner. So uh, I want to just review kind of what we've learned about age-related hearing loss. We'll recap some of the things, and then we'll open it up for questions. So age-related hearing loss is very common. I know we talked about this in the beginning. I'll bring it back to the end. It's very common. I, I don't think there should be stigma associated with it because it affects one in three adults over the age of 65, and one in two adults, half, half the population over 70 years. And we know that untreated hearing loss is associated with increased health risks, especially dementia. Medicare, Medicaid, and most private insurances cover that hearing test, so the knowledge is free, even if the hearing technology is not. And hearing aids and hearing technology have advanced super rapidly in the past, I would say, five years, but 10 to 15 years, they're a lot different than what they used to be. So if your idea of a hearing aid is based on maybe what you've seen 15 years ago, they've changed a lot and it might be worth reconsidering. There are low and no tech solutions that will improve your hearing and your communication with and without hearing loss. It's really important to advocate for yourself. You guys were great at coming up with some solutions for, for how you could advocate with your doctor with your granddaughter. Um, some of the ones that we talked about, ask your doctor to document the hearing loss in your medical chart and tell family and friends the way that they want to communicate with you. With that, that is the end of my age-related hearing loss presentation and I am happy to take some questions if you have any.